Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're here today um, to talk about the impact of this administration's agenda on small business and job creation. Uh, we already know that for the last year and a half, uh, this administration has been running banks, insurance companies, car companies, nationalized the student loan business, taken over our health care, and a whole agenda of massive uh, spending with their budget to increase the uh, debt, uh, to double the debt in five years and triple it in 10. All of small businesses looking at all of that activity, the additional burdens through a number of those proposals and wondering what else could they do? Well, it's coming. Uh, they propose to raise taxes on the top two brackets, and we'll probably have that debate in September, which would capture 50 percent of small business income and up to 25 percent of the workforce will have a devastating impact by raising taxes in the middle of a recession. So we've got <clears throat> with us several of uh, my colleagues and also some small business people who will uh, give you a sense of how all of this impacts the business people who would like to be able to hire. But the uh, impact of all of this uh, taxation, regulation, and yes, increased litigation as well has a deterrent effect on what we would all like to do, which is to create more jobs. With that, let me uh, see who's next. <clears throat> I thought I might just mention uh, a couple of comments by writers. I've noticed increasingly that our, uh, the newspaper pages and, uh, and magazines are filled with commentary by people who are concerned about the future of our country and relate directly the tax policy to that. And more and more people are saying, that the worst thing one could do would be to raise taxes. And I thought a couple of them put it particularly well. DeRoy Murdoch, for example, uh, writes, if pumping money into people's pockets stimulates the economy, vacuuming money from their pockets should depress the economy. And these small business folks who you're going to hear from today can certainly validate that. He says the best way to cheer up the economy and those who make it tick is for Washington to stop raising taxes and reverse its reckless and relentless spending spree. Well, folks, that says it all. There is one excuse, though, that people use for raising taxes. Well, they say, uh, after having spent all of this money, we have to do something about the deficit. And I thought that Dan Henninger had the perfect response to this. He writes, raising taxes to cut the deficit is a bailout for the spenders. Well, exactly. And the object is not to bail out the spenders, but to encourage those who create jobs in America and enable us to grow. They are the people behind us here, behind me, and I'm anxious for you to hear their real life stories about what enables them to succeed. About three weeks ago, a group of business people went down to see the president at his invitation to talk about what could be done to create new jobs? And according to the newspaper accounts, the president said, why aren't we creating more jobs? And the businessmen and women said back to the president, with respect, Mr. President, it's your agenda. And what they meant was the stimulus package soaking up capital. That makes it harder to create jobs. The new health care law taxing investors and jobs creators. That makes it harder to create jobs. The new financial regulation bill making credit harder to get and more expensive. That makes it harder to create jobs. It's harder to create jobs when you propose a national energy tax that runs jobs overseas. It's harder to create jobs when you propose ending the secret ballot in union elections. And now uh, we see the proposal is to raise taxes uh, on half the small business income in the middle of a recession, affecting 25 percent of the workers. And of course, that makes it harder to create jobs. So. Uh, we need a change in direction. The change in direction needs to be to put a focus on creating a pro-growth environment for private sector jobs instead of a series of policies that makes it harder to create jobs. You know, in the 22 years before I was elected to Congress, I ran a small business in Atlanta, Georgia, a real estate brokerage company. I remember an IRS regulatory change in 1983 that caused me to hire one full-time employee and one part-time employee. Regulatory compliance is a cost as much of a confiscatory cost as can be higher taxation. And in just one example of what's happened in this administration, Section 9006 of the Health Care Act requires every small business in America to file a 1099 on any payment of any expense over $600 
for goods purchased from another company. There is no good, there's nothing from that information that helps the IRS or helps the small business. But the regulatory requirement means a new employee in the accounting department, new paperwork, higher cost of doing business, less revenue to the company. That's bad for business and it's bad for America. And I want to commend Mike Johans, who cannot be here tonight, who introduced the Small Business Paperwork Mandate Reduction Act, which repeals Section 9006 of the health care bill. That's a step forward in the right direction. Good afternoon. My name is Craig Fritchie. I'm a Tart Lumber Company out near Dulles Airport. Just here to say a few words about our small business. I'm not a professional speaker, and when you read your friends talking about the federal government and all the problems you have, you use certain language and certain terms, and you really get upset. When you're here in front of all you all, you're very careful about what you say. But I just want to tell it like it is, as far as a small business and what we're going through. The construction industry, as you know, has been very, very hurt in the last few years. Our business is less than half the size it was in 2005. Uh, we went from about 73 employees to, down to 48. We did it through attrition. I'm proud to say in the 20 years I've been at Tart Lumber, we've laid off one person, and we made sure he had a job within three months. Our employees, we know them by their first names. They're not numbers. They're people. We loan them money when they have problems. But we also save our money for the tough times, and that's what's helping us get us through right now. We've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in the last two years. We're probably going to lose money this year, although sales are up a little bit. I had my largest customer file Chapter 7 out of the blue in June. So we're not out of the water by any means. But the tax increases that are coming don't make a lot of sense, especially for small business. S corporations pay a, will end up paying a higher rate than Intel. Intel would pay a 35% corporate rate, and if we get back to making money again, I'll be paying 396 If you want to put a face on the rich Americans that everyone likes to talk about, the top 1%, 2%, it's the small businesses. It's the S corporations. We're lucky if we have a year we can make 400 or 500,000. We put that money back into the business. We buy trucks. We hire more people. But if the federal government wants to put it on our backs that we need to pay 39.6%, while Exxon or Intel or Microsoft pays 35%, it makes no sense. And then when you get to the estate taxes, these are small family-owned businesses. Yes, we may have a $5 million or a $6 million estate. We may have a million dollars in inventory and another million dollars on AR, and we might have a million dollars in the bank to help run our business. We, we're cautious. We don't overborrow. That's why we're still here during this recession. But the point is, we, we, may, we may show that we have 4 or $5 million, but if you want to try to tax 55% of anything over the exemption, we're going to have to sell assets just to come up with the money. Or, as many of us have to do, hire expensive accountants to do everything we can to try to save on taxes. I'd love to talk more about the 1099 regulations coming up, but I believe we have another member that would like to discuss that. Thank you. My name is Pat Felder. I'm from Louisiana. My husband and I have been in business for 23 years. We have 25 employees, all of whom we truly treat as family. All small businesses rely on their employees. They're the most valuable assets we have. Our concern with the 1099 situation is I'm looking around my office trying to figure out who is going to absorb this work. I cannot do it. No one in my office can do it. We're all up to here. We're working as hard as we can. So what do I do? to fill out a 1099 for every single purchase that I make over $600. Every three weeks or so, we have a, um, a barbecue at the, at the plant. We purchase meat. We've been buying it from the same place for years. It costs us about $300 each time we do this. Now, what do I do? I'm going to have to fill out a 1099 for this person because I'm buying meat from him. Or I'll go someplace else and buy meat from somebody else so that I don't have to fill out a 1099. I'm going to go from approximately four 1099 forms to somewhere around 200. This just doesn't make any sense. You know, in small business owners, we don't do things that don't make sense or we don't stay in business very long. 
So we are here hoping that some sense will come back into, some rationale will come back into the way we go about trying to punish the small businesses that provide the jobs. Now, on a different issue, I have to plug one more thing. Being from Louisiana, of course, I was here earlier today involved in a press conference to try and hope that someone will listen and lift this moratorium. It is killing our, our, our coastline. It is killing the people down there. We know these people. We are down there all the time. So we are praying that somebody will listen while we're up here and lift the moratorium. So I just had to get that in. Being from Louisiana, couldn't leave without saying so, but thank you all very much. Hi, my name is Phyllis Burledge. I'm right next door in Maryland, and I'm a small business accountant. I'd like to be one of those high-priced accountants, but I'm dealing with a lot of small businesses, so I haven't quite gotten there. I can't tell you, and I could speak for a long time, how angry my clients are and how frustrated they are by this new 1099 mandate. If you think $600, $600 is $50 a month in expense. It's very easy to spend $50 a month, office supplies, telephone, computer software, this is going to be a um, really beneficial to the software companies because small businesses are going to be forced to basically retool all of their accounting software in order to have the ability to accumulate the data that you need. But you have to think about the individual business operators. My husband is a trucker. Now, should he be traveling across country as a long-haul trucker? trucker with a stack of W-9s so he can collect federal ID numbers at all the fuel stops so that we can accumulate how much he spent in fuel when he could easily put $600 worth of fuel into the truck just one time in a week. Do you see the long distance salesmen who are out there filling up their tanks with gas with a stack of, of W-9s collecting federal ID numbers? Not only do you have to collect those federal ID numbers, but you have to accumulate this data in a way that you can put these 1099s together. And then on top of that, it appears to me that most of this data is going to be totally useless to Internal Revenue Service. Many businesses operate on a, on a, um, a, a fiscal year. They're not closing their books at the end of December every year. 1099s are issued on a calendar year basis. Many businesses operate on an accrual basis. 1099s are issued on a cash basis. A cash basis means you issue a 1099 in the year that you write the check. An accrual basis means that you expense the item in the year that you accrue the expense. It may be a payable at the end of the year. So the idea that there's going to be some big IRS accounting program that can match all of these 1099s to the income and expenses of the recipients is ludicrous. So you're putting a paperwork burden on small business that is going to have little if no benefit to Internal Revenue Service and to closing the tax gap. Do the right thing and repeal this bill. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, I, we'd prefer the questions be addressed to our, our small business no, colleagues. Please indulge me for a second here. Democrats have been very successful over the past few years at tanking this higher tax bracket of tax cuts to the rich. They've also been pretty successful when we argue that we need to cut the taxes for the sake of the economy of saying they're going to reduce the deficit. As you're pushing this message now, how do you overcome that message and what does public backing? Well, some of it has been said here. First of all, uh, the tax that will be increased is going to directly impact this small businessman right here. He already said so. Is that a desirable thing? Do we need to raise taxes on the people who create the jobs in our country? And small business generally creates the jobs first out of a recession. So it's both contrary to job creation and economic growth and it hurts people. And what good does it do, as I, as I quoted here? Um, raising taxes to deal with the deficit is like a bailout for the big spenders. The answer is to stop spending so much and promote economic growth so that the economic uh, recovery and the addition to the gross domestic product will generate the tax revenues that the government needs. According to the CBO, by 2020, 
we will be above the historic level of uh, revenue collections by the federal government. I think it's at 18.6 percent. But under the current budget, we will be at a historic high in spending, over 25 percent of GDP. So the problem is not a lack of revenues for which you need to raise taxes. The problem is too much spending. And if we want to save our economy and put people back to work, like the folks that work for these folks, then we don't want to raise taxes. Question for some of these folks here. That was in, that was that was the offset on the housing tax credit, right. which was what the um, the uh, intra company transfers and purchases, not the inter company transfer and purchases. It's, it's a different. It's an intra company within the country, not ex, not inter. Any questions for our guests here? Some of them came a long way to be with you. Anything else? Well, thank you all very much for being here. We appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a job. Absolutely. Job